Pretend Catholic University Marquette flirts with unaccepting an incoming freshman because of her conservative values and her support for Donald Trump. I guess where politics and Marquette are involved, IHS no longer means in his service. It means I hate students who reject anti-Christian bigotry. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and Marquette, just quit pretending, sell off all the church property, and go full secular, full woke all the time. Hello everybody and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we're talking about the social justice mobs on campus where even students at Catholic universities must denounce Donald Trump and conservative values or risk being kicked out or disinvited. But first we turn it over to Katie with a look at the health of our republic. This week on Healthy Republic, President Donald Trump is being called a racist, so it's just another day that ends in Y. But this time, it's because of the 4th of July, and on that Y day, he called for unity, liberty, and safety. So why is he the racist? Isn't Snoop Dogg the real racist? Let's find out. Don't tell me white people are the only racists. I'm so beyond this patronizing belief that all white people and only white people are to blame for gall darn everything, and I know you are too. If you don't have that melanin in your skin, you're being told you are a racist. But since I judge people by their actions, let's begin by taking a look at the actions of a few guys from the 4th of July weekend. Those actions are of one Kelvin Cortazar Broadus Jr., a.k.a. Snoop Dogg, compared with the actions of Donald John Trump, a.k.a. the President of the United States. Snoop decided to put onto Instagram a photo featuring black conservatives, particularly those who have spoken out on this issue of race and who have met and actually had something positive to say about the president. This is the photo. It says, the coon bunch. Like, the Brady bunch, but racist. Ain't that some sort of special? In the photo, there's Candace Owens, the Hodge twins, Herman Cain, Diamond and Silk. Snoop even included a raccoon, whom he likely didn't realize is an intelligent animal. Problem solving like this requires real brain power. But then raccoons are as smart as some monkeys. And research has shown they can even remember how to open different locks after more than a year. So these coons that Snoop Dogg is talking about are thinking for themselves. And that's what he's so offended by. It's quite a leap there, Snoop Dogg. So close, and yet so far. Maybe Snoop should be back to calling himself Snoop Lion. Meanwhile, President Trump is the racist, and so are you if you are a white person living in 2020. Ignore the fact that Snoop Dogg raps things like this. And when they bang this in the club, baby, you got to get up. Thug, and word I'm not allowed to say. Drug dealers, yeah, they giving it up. Low life, yo life, boy, we living it up. Taking chances while we dancing in the party, faux show. Slip my hoe a fody foe, and she got in the back door. B word, looking at me, strange, but you know, I don't care. Step up in this MFers, just a swing in my hair. This has been reading hip hop lyrics with someone who is not hip. Hip hop. Hip? Hip hop? Hip hop anonymous? Damn you! You get him the easy ones! How ironic that the song was released on July 4th, 2000, exactly 20 years ago. So turning now to the racism that is President Trump, leading up to this year's 4th of July, the president announced he would visit Mount Rushmore. Promptly, CNN deemed both the holiday racist and Mount Rushmore as racist. Kicking off the Independence Day weekend, President Trump will be at uh, Mount Rushmore, where he'll be standing in front of a monument of two slave owners and on land wrestled away from Native Americans, told that uh, be focusing on the effort to, quote, tear down our country's history. Ah, yes, just two slave owners up there. Nothing more. Land stolen. Slave owners. That, that's all to see here. And don't forget the scare quotes around Independence Day. See how scared CNN is to even say independence? They're just so journalistic. Also leading up to the 4th, the Democratic National Committee's official Twitter actually tweeted out that on Friday, July 3rd, President Trump would be holding a rally glorifying white supremacy 
at Mount Rushmore. Of course, they deleted the tweet afterward, but no, this is what the left views as a rally glorifying white supremacy at Mount Rushmore. Our founders launched not only a revolution in government, but a revolution in the pursuit of justice, equality, liberty, and prosperity. No nation has done more to advance the human condition than the United States of America. And no people have done more to promote human progress than the citizens of our great nation. Accurate. They enshrined a divine truth that changed the world forever when they said, all men are created equal. These immortal words set in motion the unstoppable march of freedom. Keep on keeping on. Our founders boldly declared that we are all endowed with the same divine rights given us by our Creator in heaven. And that which God has given us, we will allow no one ever to take away, ever. Amen. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history, to fame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. Bingo. What about any of that is inaccurate or glorifying white supremacy? Answer, nada. But remember, orange man bad. Okay, fine. Then let's listen to the previous president saying the same damn thing. It's important to remember what a miracle this country is. How, incredible, how incredibly lucky we are that uh, people generations ago were willing to take up arms and fight for our freedom. And then people inside this country understanding that there were imperfections in our union were willing to keep on fighting on behalf of extending that freedom to all people and not just some. I'm just over here with my mind on my money and my money on my mind. You know, just sipping on gin and juice, like Snoop. Now let's hear from Senator Tammy Duckworth. What say you about the president's speech? I mean, his, his priorities are all wrong here. He should be talking about what we're going to do to overcome this pandemic. What are we going to do to push Russia back? And instead, so, he, he had no time for that. He spent all his time talking about dead traitors. So that might be, be true, but George Washington, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would call him a traitor. And there are no. moves by some to remove uh, statues of him. Is that a good idea? I think we should listen to the, everybody. That's bullshit. You just saw several clips. Trump did no such thing. And when the Asian American senator says we should listen to everybody, it means I agree that Washington should go, but I'm a politician and don't want to be held responsible. And that then is also CNN allowing insanity onto the airwaves. It's what they are known for. It's what they do. And if you dare step out of line with their narrative, you'll get called to the mat, like Don Lemon did with actor Terry Crews. The anchor black man was racist against the actor black man because the actor black man had the nerve to think for himself. Crews dare tweet, Are all white people bad? No. Are all black people good? No. Knowing this reality, I stand on my decision to unite with good people, no matter the race, creed, or ideology. Given the number of threats against this decision, I also decide to die on this hill. You know, it must have been Scary Terry who took over regular Terry's tweet. Oh, I love being Scary Terry. <laughs> he says what regular Terry's thinking. Yeah, you do, Terry. And then Cruz was invited onto Don Lemon's show to discuss the backlash for that very truthful tweet. In the exchange, all Cruz was trying to do was discuss the reality of Black Lives Matter and how the organization has an agenda that does not care about all the lives of all black people, especially the children, and the violence and death that has been bestowed upon them. No! I'm already in your head. As a defense mechanism, Donnie wouldn't let Cruz speak because Lemonhead is basically a spokesperson for the Marxist organization. But when you look at the organization, Police brutality is not the only thing they're talking about. I know that. Uh, I agree, uh, that, but that's not what the Black Lives Matter movement is about, Terry. Black Lives Matter is about police brutality and about, and about criminal justice. It's not about what happens in, in communities when it comes to crime, black on black crime. People who live near each other, black people, 
kill each other. Same as whites. Eighty some percent of white people are killed by white people true. because of proximity. Very true. It's the same thing with black people. But that again, happens in every single I neighborhood. But that isn't again. I'm not you saying know, that's not like important that those 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 kids die. But it's a different people. movement. Oh, Don Lemon, you little lemon head. At one point, Lemon felt the need to lecture Cruz by making an absurd comparison. Terry, they it's, want to kick you out. You're, you're a high profile person. You're writing things out there. You know you're going to get backlash. You know people are going to respond to what you're saying on Twitter. So you, uh, I just I don't think you should be surprised by that. I, you know, I have a, a skin as tough as an armadillo because of what I do. And I think maybe you should adapt that. Oh, really? Armadillo. Don has provided some lemon drop tears over the years or even just a few months ago. Today That's why is, you're here to talk was, about the president's can I, address. Can I finish now? No, but, no, 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 you Let can't, John. John, because we're here to talk oh, about I can't the president's talk. Wait, we're here. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to go on and deflect and talk about something else. Racism exists. But to think that racism exists only with white people against black people is absurd. As absurd as Snoop Dogg, Don Lemon, and the rest of CNN, and all of the racist things they have said and done just this past week about people who are not of the low melanin. Rather than focusing on skin tone, focus on remembering that the 4th of July and every other day of the year allows you to be free because you are an American, and that includes all skin tones. Until next time, stay healthy, America. Joined today by Professor John McAdams at Marquette University. He's a professor of political science, and he is the author of the Marquette Warrior blog. Now, John, I think many of you know that John is the courageous professor who actually was fired for defending a student at Marquette University who was actually taking a position on gay marriage that was very much in line with the Catholic Church. John defended the student who was being persecuted. They fired him. It took the Wisconsin Supreme Court to actually reinstate John at his position. Uh, John, I want to Thank you for being here today, and thank you for fighting the good fight. Well, well, thank you. You published a new, uh, what, recently published a new Marquette Warrior blog about a young student at, that, was, that had just gained admission to Marquette University. She was all accepted, ready to show up in the fall, where some left-wing agitators found out by looking at, I don't even know how they found out she was getting in, but they found out that she was getting in, and they looked at her social media profile, and this young student, female, was a conservative. She was very critical of certain aspects of Black Lives Matter, and this touched off a controversy. Talk about the controversy. Well, the first thing they noticed is she uh, posted on Instagram uh, a, a post about her bragging about uh, her being a supporter of Donald Trump. She was a proud supporter of Donald Trump. And uh, another Marquette student who saw her Instagram account said, you've got to watch out for her. And uh, then they went through her uh, various posts on Instagram, um, found out uh, that uh, she didn't much care for the transgender agenda. She basically said, well, if somebody wants to live that way, but that's their business, but don't expect me to uh, say that they are that a guy who thinks he's a woman really is uh, is a woman. Um, and she certainly did not like illegal immigration. So um, uh, this, uh, this woman, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Cook, um, and lots of her friends, um, Aaron posted a form letter to uh, Marquette saying, well, she's a bad person, she's a racist, She's a transphobe, et cetera, et cetera. You really don't want to admit her. And uh, th she'd already been admitted. But colleges these days have sometimes canceled the admission of students uh, who made some posts that the politically correct types objected to. So uh, they got a lot of emails from the you know hard leftist uh, and uh, they called her up her name was samantha uh, they called her up and quizzed her you know asking questions like if you were admitted don't you think you know uh, immigrant students uh, or uh, uh, you know dreamers so called uh, or transgender students would feel unsafe you know that's sort of the standard thing if you're politically correct member of a politically correct victim group, you're supposed to be able to feel unsafe just knowing people on campus 
have opinions you don't like. Um, anyway, this was two weeks ago today. Um, she didn't hear, they, they, they quizzed her, they basically interrogated her. Uh, she didn't hear back from him for several days. And then a week ago, this past Sunday, nine days ago, uh, she contacted another conservative student uh, at Marquette who contacted me and uh, I blogged about it. And of course, I sent the uh, blog post to um, conservative talk radio in Milwaukee and several of the conservative talkers, Steve Scafidi, Vicki McKenna and Mark Belling got onto that, which I put it on Facebook and there was a considerable blowback. Um, uh, so finally, uh, as of yesterday morning, uh, the admissions office uh, contacted her and said, well, you need to understand your admissions status has not been changed. And they even said they wanted to talk to her and talk about the harassing uh, messages and emails she'd gotten. So she essentially won. But given the initial response of Marquette to put her through an inquisition, um, it really looks like they were initially inclined just to uh, kick her out. And it seems the pressure uh, that was built up uh, changed their minds. Well, too, she also got a lawyer. That probably helped. The threat of law, legal intervention also probably, I would imagine, spurred Marquette to do the right thing. And it's interesting to me, John, that um, she's the one who's the harasser for having private opinions, personal opinions that disagree with the progressive left. She's the one who's the harasser, while this girl, this Aaron, who didn't even know her, is trying to get her canceled from her university education. I'm pretty sure Marquette never asked Samantha, uh, how do you feel about being harassed? harassed by the Aaron Cooks of the world. After we come back from break, we'll, we'll take this a little bit further. Thanks, John. Back with John McAdams, professor of political science at Marquette University. And so Samantha's story ended well. She, got, she was smart. She got a lawyer. The lawyer, I'm sure, was looking over her shoulder. The university found out probably that she had a lawyer. And rather than uninvite her, uh, they are going to let her come, at least according to right now. But they're obviously going to keep a close eye on her for her harassing positions. How did we get to a situation like this, John? Both in the case that was waged against you, this case and others at Marquette, what is it with Catholic universities, so-called Catholic universities? They seem to go out of their way to hire faculty who are not even anti, they're not even anti-Catholic, they're militantly anti-Catholic. That seems to be how the hiring goes. We see that these departments become uh, overstocked with people who are actively fighting against a Catholic agenda. How does this happen? And is there any hope in the future that Marquette might even return to some sort of a, well, I'm sure most moms and dads think they're paying for a real Catholic education for their kids, but they're not getting it. But they're not getting it. In addition to a heavily leftist faculty, Marquette has watered down the curriculum so that you can graduate with only one course in theology and one course in philosophy in a so-called Catholic University. Um, you have to remember that there are various things going on here. Um, academics hire other academics, and academics have a vested interest in reputability with mainstream academia. That is to say, uh, if you've got one job candidate who's published a good deal in mainstream journals, and another who's published a good deal less, but is clearly Catholic and has a Catholic orientation, you're likely to hire the person who doesn't have the Catholic orientation. And frankly, in political science hiring, I've sort of been guilty of that myself. I've gone with sort of secular credentials. Did you have really good recommendations from a really top PhD program? Uh, as for the administrators, they are particularly concerned uh, not with what Catholic parents think. They're particularly concerned with, say, what the mainstream media think. Uh, at Marquette, they care about what the journal Sentinel says about them. That's a liberal newspaper. Um, they are overly bureaucratized. All organizations uh, have an incentive to have too much bureaucracy, particularly when they don't operate in a real competitive market. And the problem in higher education is they're established prestige hierarchies such uh, that 
it's hard for an institution to compete by simply being you know, leaner uh, and uh, cheaper and giving an equally good education uh, for less money. Um, I mean, Harvard can do anything. Harvard can be absurdly inefficient and absurdly politically correct, and there's still Harvard and lots of people want to, to get in. Uh, so you don't have uh, much in the way of a real competition. Uh, you have uh, lots of bureaucracy, a lot of bureaucracy dedicated to pandering to politically correct victim groups. Marginalized groups is the politically uh, correct uh, term. Um, so the um, bureaucrats just uh, instinctively uh, pander, uh, instinctively look for uh, initiatives. You know, if you're a bureaucrat and want to move from one institution to a more prestigious institution or higher paying job, you need lots of initiatives. And you don't really have the power to uh, have any initiative that actually improves education much, but you can have all kinds of initiatives around diversity and you put all that together it's a toxic brew and that makes a lot of sense explain this though to me i get the culture but why is it when you do have the rare catholic school uh, catholic kid who actually wants to be catholic or or defends catholic ideas why is it that they come down on these kids like a ton of bricks i could see them the institutional argument you just made but this seems to be something more an active persecution uh, or like you professors who try to defend or at least protect kids who run afoul of the thought police where is there the compassion in a catholic university for for those kids it's important to remember that people on the right mostly just want to live their lives and get on with it but people on the left tend to be crusaders moralists they tend to be very adamant uh, they believe themselves fighting heresies they'll say we're fighting racism sexism uh, structural racism homophobia blah blah uh, and they're very adamant they're willing to try to destroy careers uh, to marginalize and demonize people whom they disagree with so if you're a typical university bureaucrat you're probably more worried about what the campus leftists are going to say and leftists off of campus uh, than you are about what uh, mainstream quiet liberals or conservative faculty think because they're not saying anything. They're laying low. They're keeping their heads down. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's unfortunate. I mean, I think that yeah, we. I think your blog and the fact that this went uh, a little bit viral with some of the conservative media and the fact that the young student, Samantha, was able to get a lawyer, I think that got her in. I'm not sure all that's going to keep her in unless she, if she stays faithful to what she actually believes. I know you're going to be tracking this for us. We'll keep an eye on ourselves, and we wish her the best. Hopefully, she'll get through Marquette with a degree. It is now that special time, time for some real education. Sir Thomas Wyatt was a 16th century English politician, ambassador, and lyric poet credited with introducing the sonnet to English literature. His father, Henry, was a privy counselor for Henry VII and remained a trusted advisor when Henry VIII ascended the throne in 1509. Thomas followed his father to court after his education at St. John's College in Cambridge. Entering the king's service, he was entrusted with many important diplomatic missions. His poems were circulated at court and may have been published anonymously during his lifetime but were not published under his name until after his death. The clever lyric poem, Whoso List to Hunt, is among his most famous poems. And Whoso List to Hunt is the poem we're going to talk about today. Thomas Wyatt is not remembered much for a diplomat or an ambassador anymore, but he is remembered for really the probably the greatest English poet alive under the reign of Henry VIII. He was Henry VIII's servant. Henry, as you know, was monumentally temperamental, especially about his wives. And it's interesting that he was a, a, really a court poet. He wrote these beautiful verses. He was, was responsible for taking the English, son, the Italian sonnet sequence and really making it a legitimate form in England. And he wrote some really beautiful beautiful sonnets about love and about uh, a despised love and about rejection in love. But he was also Thomas Wyatt, good looking and very much a ladies man, which is also an incredibly dangerous thing to be in the court of Henry. So take a look at this poem here. It's called Whoso List to Hunt. Of course, the major conceit, the major theme of this poem is that falling in love and seeking somebody to love is like a hunt. 
Whoso list to hunt, those of you who would play this game, whoso list to hunt, I know where is a hind, a hind being a young buck, a young doe. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is a hind, but as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am the of them that farthest come behind. And so that first quartet, those first four lines, Wyatt lays out the fact that he's been hunting this particularly interesting deer this very sweet young hind. He's been hunting her and hunting her and hunting her, but now he's got to stop. He's actually fallen way behind. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is in hind. But as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am of them that farthest come behind. Now you get a little more inf information in the next four lines, the next quartet. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer. But as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow. I leave off, therefore. Sithens in a net I seek to hold the wind. In spite of all of his recognition. That, and notice how with each line you begin to find out the hunter is really the one in danger. The hunter is really the one. You, you now don't know why yet, but the hunter's in, in trouble. He says, I can't stop thinking of her. Yet I by, by, by no means my wearied mind am able to draw from the deer. But as she flees before me, Fainting, panting, I follow. I stop, I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Ah, an admission that he's engaging in something very dangerous. It's like trying to catch the wind in a net. Now in that final quatrain, that final four lines, you get a little bit more here. Who list her hunt? If you're going to hunt this particular deer, he says, I put him out of doubt as well as I may spend his time in vain. That if he choose, whoever, I'm, I'm giving up, he says, but whoever wants to pursue this deer really better be very careful because your trouble is going to be my trouble. Whoso list her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. And graven with diamonds in letters plain, there is written her fair neck about. Oh, and by the way, when you get close enough to this pretty little deer, you will see that she's got a collar. She's already been caught. And she wears a collar, and written around her neck in diamonds is the phrase, Noli mi tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. And now you find out that the woman being pursued by Thomas Wyatt is no less than Anne Boleyn. And you may remember, Anne Boleyn is the wife, is the young, pretty young girl he dumped his first wife to marry. And he, on account of that marriage, he completely broke apart the Roman Catholic Church, made himself the head of the Church of England, and gave legitimacy to the Protestant, Re Protestant Reformation. So Thomas Wyatt, yep, he's that guy who's chasing after Anne Boleyn at the same time she's being wooed by Henry. So the, guy, the guy's got, I would, the guy's got a lot of pluck. I was going to say something else. Uh, He's got a lot of pluck. Going after Anne when, he, when it is absolutely known that Anne is being pursued by Henry. And there does seem to be some supporting evidence that maybe Anne and Thomas had a bit of a fling before she ended up the wife of Henry VIII. So you can see these romantic sonnet games being played in the 16th century. Sometimes they were about a lot more than girlfriends and boyfriends. Sometimes they were about life and death. Scandal. All right, as always, you can follow us on Facebook and Parlor. And if you have a question for the Friday Q&A, visit freedomproject.com slash askduke or send us a message on social media. Now, as a reminder, Freedom Project Academy's live online school is enrolling new students, but we just have one more week of enrollment. Here's a quick message from FPA's principal, Mr. Harper. Hi, I'm Dave Harper, principal of Freedom Project Academy. Here at FPA, we have been engaging students in high-quality online instruction through a classical curriculum for 10 years. We use sophisticated, interactive software designed for teaching online that is very user-friendly and fosters student participation in our live classes, not like Google Hangouts or Zoom meetings. Our outstanding instructors publish weekly assignment sheets, homework, and assessments in our learning management system that are easily accessible from a student's or parent's computer to any mobile device. We always encourage parents to be involved in their child's education and make everything available for them to see, including class instruction. We hope you'll consider joining us this fall and experience for yourself the phenomenal learning activities and engaging online environment our teachers create for students. For enrollment information, visit fpeusa.org. That's fpeusa.org. 
Again, remember, enrollment ends in just one week from today. So make sure to request your free information packet at freedomforschool.com. That's freedom, F-O-R, school.com. Now we're going to wrap things up with the fun fact of the day. Going back to what we talked about in Healthy Republic, Terry Crews has many talents in addition to being an actor, including being a former NFL player, a sketch artist, a painter, a flautist, and a pectoral dancer. The only thing that could get me to watch the NFL ever again in my life, those ungrateful bastards, is if Terry Crews were to break Don Lemon in half on CNN. Then I would become an NFL fan again. And then he'll play his flute. He'll play his flute. And that's going to do it for this week. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Until next time, stay educated, my friends.